Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and I'm happy to welcome you to the final session of our spring series on Relating to God. Um, welcome. If this is the first time uh, for any of you attending, it's been a short series, just five sessions, so you're welcome to catch up on the series page. <clears throat> And we're so pleased to have uh, Chancellor Emeritus, uh, Professor Arnold Eisen teaching us today on Jewish theology in America today and tomorrow. Um, and we're very grateful to JTS trustee Yale Askell for sponsoring today's session at the Navi level, the $1,800 level. Thank you so much, Yale. Um, and for, for for your ongoing support of this um, of our Monday webinars, you've supported, you've sponsored several sessions. We're so grateful. Um, we are, I want to tell you, working on uh, a new summer series. So um, we're hoping to be ready to announce it today. We're not quite there, uh, but please stay tuned. We'll be starting the new series in a few weeks. It's on stories and storytelling, um, drawing from a lot of different disciplines. We're really excited about it. Um, and I do want to make clear, because apparently there's been confusion um, when we've launched new series in the past. Um, when we, when you registered for the current series and it said your registration was, you know, got you into all sessions in the series, that means the series that's ending today. So each time we start a new theme, that's a new series, even though it's, it's obviously part of our, um, the longer Monday webinar series, but you do need to register for the new series. So, um, Watch your email for that. A new series on stories and storytelling will be starting um, in a few weeks in June, and we can't wait to learn with you. Um, and uh, and as always, we have sponsorships um, open for that series, and we we so appreciate your support of these Monday webinars. Uh, so, Tanya, I'm going to turn it over to you for the remaining announcements. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so uh, just to review how we do uh, like the format of the session and how we do our Q&A, uh, Professor Eisen will pause uh, for questions periodically throughout the session. And, and again, at the end, please chat your questions to Rabbi Andelman um, and she will select a few questions to, pre to present to Professor Eisen. Uh, for any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or Lynn Feynman. The sources for today's class were in the email that you received with the Zoom link uh, for the session, and we'll be screen sharing them as well. Um, pleased to introduce uh, Professor Eisen. Um, Arnold Eisen is Chancellor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Seminary and Professor of Jewish Thought. Professor Eisen is the author of several works, including Galut, Modern Jewish Reflection on Homelessness and Homecoming, and Rethinking Modern Ju Judaism, Ritual, Commandment, Community, and co-author of The Jew Within. As chancellor, Professor Eisen was committed to bringing JTS scholarship outside the walls of JTS, which led to the inception of many of our adult learning offerings that we currently have today, including our Monday webinar series. Uh, you can learn more about Professor Eisen on the full bio page uh, that's included with the sources. Um, and we're, we're so pleased to have him teaching for us today. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Professor Eisen. Okay, good. Thanks, Tani and Julia. It's great to be here with you all today. I was especially delighted when I was asked to teach about theology for three reasons. First, the minute I stepped down as chancellor, which was at the end of June in 2020, I began working on a project that I had wanted to do for a long time, which is to write a personal theology. Now, it might be surprising to you, as it was to me, that I have not done this before. I'm a scholar of modern Jewish thought. I've been teaching other people's theologies for something like 40 years. I was chancellor of JTS for 13. I gave hundreds and hundreds of speeches about Judaism, but I had never sat down to, to try to set out coherently what it is I think about God and relating to God. And I was approaching 70 at that point. I've now passed 70. I was 70 last summer. And it seems like this is the time. So for the last couple of years, I've been devoting myself 
to a book on theology. In fact, this morning I was revising the third chapter of that book. The second thing is that because of that book and other things, I decided to teach a course on theology this past spring, just ended, to the first year rabbinical students at JTS. It's great, as far as I'm concerned, that a school that bears the name of Jewish Theological Seminary actually has a seminar for its rabbis to be called Theology. And I was really happy to teach it. And when you teach a course like that, you don't just do it academically. You share your own personal convictions and you encourage the students to do the same as part of their development as future rabbis, leaders of the Jewish community. And so the syllabus that I drew up for them was based on the works that I had found important in writing my own personal theology. And the syllabus I drew up for today is based on that course. So I'm gonna be sharing with you some of the most important insights or works that I use in thinking theologically and that I think our rabbis need to use. And then in fact, I think all of us can use very well. And that's the third reason I'm happy to do this seminar. In a way, everything we do here in this whole seminar series about theology is a memorial tribute to our colleague, Neil Gilman, Zichon Olivacha. Neil Gilman taught theology at JTS for many years and more importantly, no less importantly, taught theology to adults and to campers and to day school students and anyone else who would, who would join him in engagement of a subject that he thought should not be left to scholars and philosophers alone. Neil was convinced that all of us can and should think theologically. And he wrote a couple of books which encouraged everyone to develop their own personal theologies. And some of you may have taken his classes and participated in that exercise. And so we are going to do something like that today. I see myself very much as continuing the legacy of Neil Gilman and asking us all to think theologically. So let me begin where I began my seminar with the conviction that modern Judaism is different than anything that has gone before it in certain key ways. That is, if you are a modern Jew, we're going to start modernity somewhere like in the 18th century, you might say with the American Revolution or the French Revolution, something like that, you think about these things somewhat differently that, than your ancestors did. And so I begin my seminar with two pages from the book that is generally considered to mark the start of Jewish thought in the modern period, which is Moses Mendelssohn's book, Jerusalem, which was published in 1783, not coincidentally, halfway between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Mendelssohn, as you may know, was one of the greatest philosophers of his time, not only the greatest Jewish philosopher, and he was challenged by an anonymous pamphlet that he thought was written by a Christian friend of his to explain how a person as smart as he is and as enlightened as he is could possibly also want to be a faithful Jew. And he responds to that challenge by writing this book, Jerusalem, one, still one of the greatest works of modern Jewish thought, and to me, extremely relevant. And Tani, let's put that page up on screen. And what I've given you now is a page, two pages, from the second part of the book, the second of two parts of the book, where Mendelssohn says he's going to summarize. So now he's going to tell you what he thinks are the chief elements of Judaism. And you'll notice that Judaism has to him three elements. And after we read these three elements, I'm going to argue that those elements and the assumptions that go into them are crucial to modern Jewish thought, to all of our thinking as modern Jews. First, Judaism contains religious doctrines and propositions. He calls them eternal truths about God and God's government and providence, without which man cannot be enlightened and happy. These are not forced upon the faith of the nation under the threat of eternal or temporal punishment but in accordance with the nature and evidence of eternal truths are recommended to rational acknowledgement. You look at the proof text there, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the majesty of God. We don't need Torah or anything else to teach it to us. The heavens declare the majesty of God and the firmament 
announces the work of God's hands. So in short, reason, reason is the source of our knowledge of God and morality, reason which Jews share with every other human being. Tony, let's go into the second page now. There's a second element in Judaism, you see at number two there, which we have distinctive to Judaism, but which are parallel to what every other religion offers. We have historical truths. You and I would probably call these historical narratives, not historical truths. Records of the vicissitudes of former ages, especially of the circumstances in the lives of the nation's forefathers, of their having come to know the true God, of the way of life before God, of the transgressions and the paternal chastisement that followed them, or the covenant which God concluded with them, and of the promise which God so often repeated to make of their descendants in the days to come a nation consecrated to God. So these are Passover, uh, Sinai, Shavuot, uh, the ideas of creation, revelation, and redemption. These are historical truths. We have Passover, Christians have Easter, Muslims have their holidays. We have um, Hanukkah, Christians have Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. So every religious group has historical truths or narratives as we would call them. And this, according to Mendelssohn, it's the second key element of our tradition. And I would argue, certainly true for me, that in thinking theologically, Jews, unlike some others, do not proceed systematically to lay out truths about God, but we draw upon what we learn from observance, particularly the observance of holidays. I can tell you that when I thought about how to write my book of theology, I realized it had to start with Passover. It's going to end with Shabbat. In between, we find Yom Kippur. In thinking about these observances, we learn what it is that we believe. As the Torah says, we will do, and then we'll understand by virtue of what we do. Mendelssohn is convinced that every group proceeds in a similar fashion. And number three, here's what's really distinctive to Judaism. We have laws, precepts, commandments, and rules of life. We have mitzvot, which were to be peculiar to this nation, the Jews and through the observance of which it, the Jewish people, should arrive at national felicity or happiness, as well as personal felicity for each of its individual members. The lawgiver was God. That is to say, God, not in God's relation as creator and preserver of the, of the universe, but God as patron and friend by covenant of their ancestors, as liberator, founder, and leader, as king and head of the people. God gave the laws the most solemn sanction publicly in a never before heard of miraculous manner by which they were imposed upon the nation and all their descendants as an unalterable duty and obligation. So again, we have just mitzvot. We think in the midst of and out of and surrounded by and drawing upon these mitzvot. I doubt if we could think theologically if we didn't reflect upon the observances that we perform. I don't think that Jewish, Jewish theology can be done in the abstract. And certainly that's not the way the Jewish theologians throughout the ages have proceeded. We proceeded by giving reasons for the commandments. Ta mea mitzvot. We proceed by saying, what does it mean to us that we visit the sick? Why should we feed the hungry? Why should we put on tefillin? Why should we? Davin, why should we study Torah? According to Mendelssohn, these laws need to be transmitted orally because they need to be adjusted, adapted by each succeeding generation so that they stay relevant and dynamic. All right, so those are three assumptions, I think, of all Jewish thought. And when you go back to number one, I would ask you to think about for yourself, what is the source of your moral convictions? What is your source? What is the source of your vision of God's role as creator? Does it come from Sefer Breshit primarily? Or does it come from Einstein and Newton and the latest story about what the Hubble Space Telescope has discovered about the cosmos? 
Where's, where does your moral knowledge come from? Again, does it come from the Torah? Does it come from Pirkei Avot? Does it come from conscience? Does it come from teachings from your parents, ancestors, community? So Mendelssohn is posing a question, which I think all moderns have to answer. How much do we share with others? How distinctive are we? How important are these observances of festivals like Pesach to us? And how important are the mitzvot as a source of knowledge, as an expression of what we, we believe, and as a teaching of what we should believe? Now I'm going to mention three assumptions, which are unspoken for the most part, but find expression in the book, and I think are crucial to every modern Jewish thinker. I won't take the time to document that, but I would stipulate that every modern Jewish thinker, without exception, whether Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, is basing themselves somehow on these three axiomatic assumptions. Number one, in the modern period, unlike in the pre-modern period, Jewish identity is voluntarist. It is chosen. You don't have to do it. Before the modern period, the medieval period, under Christianity and Islam, you basically had to keep kosher, because if you didn't keep kosher, Jews would not eat with you. And if you didn't want to eat with Jews, you would eat alone, because no one else was going to do it. Now it's a choice. Am I going to be Jewish? How much am I going to be Jewish? It occurred to me the first time I taught Mendelssohn that before him, every Jewish thinker did not have to worry that a Jew might disagree with what they wrote. Yeah, you disagree with what you wrote, so you don't like Maimonides, so you go with Yehuda Levi, but you're not going to stop being Jewish because you disagree with what a Jewish thinker writes. A Jewish thinker who doesn't like a modern Jewish book or finds it meaningless may decide as a result not to be a Jew. That's the situation of every modern Jewish thinker, of you and me, of every parent, of every teacher. People can choose not to be Jewish. They can choose to reject Judaism. It puts a new burden on Jewish thought. Jewish thought now has to persuade you to do something you might not want to do otherwise. The second axiomatic assumption is that your identity is hyphenated. You're not just a Jew, or you're not a Jew living in somebody else's country. You are, if you were an American, American and a Jew. Both are parts of your identity. Mendelssohn wrote the book in German at a time when very few Jews read German because he wanted them to read German. He wanted them to get involved in enlightened German culture, the way that we are involved in American culture. He quoted from Newton and um, Bale, other scientists, the same way that we would quote Einstein and Darwin. He wanted them to be part of another culture. Their culture was hyphenated. Judaism occupies much of their thought, but not only Judaism. It's not the only source of your commitments. Finally, it's, he's a pluralist. Mendelssohn spends a lot of the book trying to persuade Christians, the rulers of Germany, that they should have room for Jews. He says, you're living in a two-story house. And you're living on the second story if you're a Christian. The first story is Judaism. Christianity is based on Judaism. You knock out the first story, the second story falls. He's trying to persuade Jews that they can find their place inside Germany. He wants Jews also to be pluralist. He says, if you don't accept them, you can't expect them to accept you. I argue that's an assumption of most modern Jewish thought. Certainly everything except for ultra-Orthodoxy certainly even modern orthodoxy, takes it for granted that there are other people around us who are deserving of respect. There are children of Noah out there who one has to fully respect, from whom one can learn a great deal. And so, where pre-modern Jews could confidently say to their children or their students, you better do this or you're not going to be saved, which is what some Christians still say, we say, uh-uh, you don't need to be Jewish to be good, to have God, to have the life to come. And that makes it a little harder, perhaps, to talk about why be Jewish, what's the uniqueness of Judaism, if we are true pluralists, as I am, and I think you probably are as well. 
Now I'm going to move, having done Mendelssohn for a few minutes, to the 20th century and move to the United States of America. And we're going to look at one of the thinkers whose work has been most influential on American Jews, and not just on American Jews, because Mordechai Kaplan has lately taken on great importance for Israelis and other Jews as well. So here's Kaplan, who begins his book, Judaism as a Civilization, which came out in 1934, written around 1930, by saying the Jews are in crisis. And the reason for the crisis, as you see here in the preface, is that the aura of divine election has departed from his people, and his Jewish origin brings with it nothing but economic handicaps and social inferiority. Remember, this is 1930. The Jew rebels against his fate. So you're suffering discrimination. You're suffering social inferiority. Of course, anti-Semitism. And what's the point? Once you don't believe in divine election anymore, why do it? This, Kaplan argues, is the fundamental reason for the change in Jewish attitudes toward Judaism. It's not merely that Judaism as a world outlook or system of life is in danger of extinction, but that the individual Jew is maladjusted morally and spiritually as a result of losing the traditional concept of salvation. He has to evolve some new purpose in life as a Jew, a purpose that will direct his energies into such lines of creativity, creativity as will bring him spiritual redemption. So Kaplan does not believe in traditional notions of salvation in a world to come. That's why a new conception of salvation has to be developed. That's why he talks about spiritual redemption. He does not believe in a God who is a personal God, who revealed the Torah, created the world, or will bring redemption to the Jewish people and everyone else. We're going to see in a moment, Kaplan does not have a personal God in his system of thought. The purpose will have to constitute salvation for Jews. It's only then that he will gladly identify himself with Jewish life. Otherwise, it's a burden, and Jews are going to attempt to throw it off. Next slide, Tony. So the reason why Kaplan rejects some of these things is that he argues we're going to, I, you see this page is full of underlining because it's so difficult. This is my original <laughs> copy of the book. Um, he wants to make a distinction between unlikeness and otherness and argue, as you see in the middle of the page there, otherness is difference in entity, unlikeness is difference in quality. We're not going to read the rest of this. Let me just say, Kaplan concludes, I think perceptively, that if, if religion is the only difference separating Jews from other people, the only difference between Jews and the majority of America Christians is that on Sundays, Christians will go to church, as most Christians used to do, and on Saturday, Jews went to synagogue. That's not going to suffice. That's what Kaplan calls a difference in quality. He wants to have Jews see themselves as different in entity. Jewishness is what you are not just one thing that you do on Saturday or other days of the weeks. And to do that, Tony, we need, the next, we need the next page. He wants you to see Judaism, next page, as a civilization. And this is the key page of the book, the key page in the title chapter, Judaism and Civilization. Put more specifically, this means that apart from the life, which as a citizen, the Jew shares with non-Jews, his life should consist of certain social relationships to maintain, cultural interests to foster, activities to engage in, organizations to belong to, amenities to conform to, moral and social standards to live up to as a Jew. All this constitutes an element of otherness. Judaism as otherness is thus something far more comprehensive than Jewish religion. It includes that nexus where things come together of a history, literature, language, social orientation, folk sanctions, standards of conduct, social and spiritual ideals, aesthetic values, which in their totality form a civilization. It is not only Judaism, the religion that is threatened, but Judaism as a civilization. It's mysterious that he left out um, homeland because the very next chapter is about um, rebuilding the Jewish homeland in Palestine. Kaplan was a fervent Zionist. But you see what he's trying to do here. He's trying to say that Judaism is more than religion. 
it's not clear that Kaplan even cares about theology. On some days, he doesn't. On other days, he seems to care about theology not getting in the way of Jewish commitment, and he believes that it does get in the way of Jewish commitment when it's false to what he thinks has to be true. For example, he wrote a book a couple of years later, I'm holding it up now, called The Meaning of God in Modern Jewish Religion, and he says in the preface to The Meaning of God, belief in God uh, for a modern Jew, let me see the right page here, belief in God for a modern Jew, can no longer be a matter of entering into relationship with the supernatural. The only kind of religion that can help the modern Jew live and get the most out of life will be the one which will teach him to identify as divine or holy, whatever human nature or in the world about him enhances human life. Or another page, belief in God as here conceived can function in our day exactly as belief in God has always functioned. It can function as an affirmation that life has value, that reality is so constituted as to endorse and guarantee the realization in man of that which is of greatest value to us. So should Jews even do theology? Some people have long argued that Judaism doesn't need theology. Certainly we don't do it the way that other religions do it, not systematically. You think of the Bible, not a systematic work. You think of the Talmud, not a systematic work or the Zohar, a collection of stories of rabbis who are out walking and teach each other lessons. Maimonides is an outlier when Jewish theology is concerned. And for Kaplan, to be a Jew is far more than to be religious. So if you're going to do Jewish thought, you need a category broader than theology, because God, you might say, should not be the be-all and end-all of Jewish existence. There are lots of other ways to be a Jew, or maybe you might put it differently and say that Jewish theology, not so much about God, but about what God or ultimate meaning or transcendence requires of us, wants of us, seeks from us, needs from us, that what Judaism is about is about how you live in the world and not about the God who allegedly created this world and governs it and someday will redeem it. So your question as a modern Jewish theologian is, how important is theology to me, really? How important is religion to me, really? Do I have God at the center of my Judaism? Or is God somehow out there, some days important, some days not so much, at other points in my system? Well, we're now going to look at a final um, background source, as it were, for today's course. And this is the counterpoint to, Hesh, to Abraham Kaplan to Mordechai Kaplan, sorry, you see where I'm going, supplied by Abraham Joshua Heschel. Now, I have to say, confessionally, that Heschel is far and away the most important um, American Jewish thinker to me, the most important modern Jewish thinker to me. I got to meet him in 1971 when I was a student. And Kaplan and Heschel, who both taught at JTS for many years, but didn't often talk to each other, talk to me every day. They argue with each other in my head every day. They argue with me every day. I check in with both of them. And here you can see how very different Heschel is from Kaplan. I'm not going to try to, in five minutes, convey the essence of Abraham Joshua Heschel's theology. But as I did with Mendelssohn, I want you to see key assumptions or consequences of Heschel's thought that are crucial, I think, to all of modern Jewish thought, certainly to all contemporary Jewish thought. So here's the first of them, a lesson that Heschel derives from the great philosopher Immanuel Kant. When we talk about the relation between science and religion and deny science the chance to determine what religion can or cannot believe, which is what Kaplan did. When we say that science and religion are working in two different realms, trying to do two different things, we are adopting the same strategy that Heschel adopted in this paragraph here before you. It's a beautiful paragraph. I'm going to read it slowly. The poetry is magnificent, but the point is crucial to theology. Is reason the source of knowledge about God, or does one have to leave reason behind in order to get to know God? So the obvious metaphor here is a seashore. 
the search of reason ends at the shore of the known. On the immense expanse beyond it, only the sense of the ineffable can glide. That which is ineffable cannot be said or expressed. That sense alone knows the root to that which is remote from experience and understanding. Neither of them is amphibious. Reason cannot go beyond the shore. The sense of the ineffable is at a place where we measure where we weigh. We do not leave the shore of the known in search of adventure or suspense or because the failure of reason to answer our questions. We sail because our mind is like a fantastic seashell. And when applying our ear to its lips, we hear a perpetual murmur from the waves beyond the shore. That's me, and that's perhaps you. I'm a pretty rational person, but I have that seashell to my ear. I hear a perpetual murmur from the waves beyond the shore. Citizens of two realms, we must sustain a dual allegiance. We sense the ineffable in one realm. We name and exploit reality in another. So science is in one place and faith is someplace else. Heschel believes there's another faculty in the self aside from mind. And that faculty is the one that's gonna take us to God. You might wanna call it soul. Now, I'm, I've included here for your benefit, Tony, can we go to the next, next one? That's right. So here we have some of the most beautiful lines, not only in Heschel, but I think in all of modern Jewish thought. And I'm not going to spend time here reading it. In a second, we're going to get to Heschel's description of an encounter with God. I, I think it's autobiographical. I, I don't see how it cannot be autobiographical. And it's very valuable for that purpose because we don't have very many autobiographical accounts of, of religious experience in all of modern Jewish thought. I think that if you're going to do theology, you should include your personal accounts of religious experience. So here Heschel says that the world in which we live is a vast cage within a maze, and you bump your, 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 yourself against the rails of the cage, and you can't get beyond it. And in a technological age, the second paragraph, this is particularly true. And even those who have knocked their heads against the rails of the cage and discovered that life is involved in conflicts which they cannot solve, the driver possessing this time you need to go down here, fills streets, homes, and hearts with its clamor and shrill, right? Drives and possessiveness, et cetera, et cetera, is constantly muffled by the irony of time. I love that. The things you most care about, the things you spend your time on and your money on are muffled by the irony of time. Our constructiveness is staved in by self-destructiveness. Even they don't go beyond the cage. Others, however, who can't stand, cannot stand at despair. Tani, next page. They have no power to spend on faith anymore, no goal to strive for, no strength to seek a goal. But then a moment comes like a thunderbolt in which a flash of the undisclosed rends our dark ap apathy asunder. It's full of overpowering brilliance. And Heschel uses very traditional language. It's like a mountain set in which you stand in front of. A tremor seizes our limbs. Our nerves are struck. It is one word, God, not an emotion, a stir within us. And now here we come. Tommy, Tommy, I need you to raise it up a little bit more to show the bottom of that page. We only know it means more, infinitely more than we were able to echo. See, we can't express what it is we've experienced. It's not rational. And here is Heschel, the mystic speaking. And you have to ask yourself if you've had experiences of God, or, or experiences of transcendence of any kind, or what the sociologist Peter Berger calls hints of this, right? If you had hints of this, um, signals of transcendence, can you say, can you put it in words? Or is it more than you are able to echo? Staggered, embarrassed, we stammer and say, God, I'm gonna get rid of the male pronouns here and say, God, who is more than all there is, who speaks through the ineffable, whose question is more than our mind can answer. Notice that. God's question is more than our mind can answer. God to whom our life can be the spelling of an answer. So you answer the question posed by God, not with words, but with how you live. 
and you go on in the book and you find out what Heschel means by that is mitzvot. For Jews, the answer to God's question is mitzvot. And um, Heschel himself, as we're going to see, was particularly devoted to acts of social justice. All right, Tani, let's pause here for the first um, round of questions or of comment or clarification. All right, thanks. We have some great questions. Um, let's start with where you where you just ended um, with Heschel and Kaplan. Um, the question is, do you, you you mentioned that you thought Heschel was being autobiographical in his description? So it's really a question about both of them. Do you think that um, how how much do you think they were being descriptive versus prescriptive? So you know, starting with Kaplan, is he kind of describing what he thinks? Um, you know, the way he thinks most Jews feel and identify, um, or or is he trying to put forward um, the way he thinks things should be? And the same for for Heschel, is he sort of trying to articulate what's so hard to articulate about religious experience, or also guide and inspire in the way he um, in the way he words things. And I guess I would just add to the question, you know, you did all the research that you did for the Jew within and, and all the other, you know, research you've, you've done in anecdotal and otherwise, do you think they're, they're descriptive or prescriptive? See, Kaplan, I want to say two things about Kaplan and then go on to Heschel. Kaplan is not an atheist. You know, he dubbed three times a day. His practice was pretty much orthodox. Otherwise, he would not have been accepted on the faculty of JTS. But he believes that God is a force. He does believe in God. But like many Jews I know, and that you know, he believes that God is much more a force than a person. But I used to laugh about this. It, it sounds a little bit like you know Star Wars, the force be with you. But Kaplan believes that God is in fact a force working for good in the universe and, and working in the world through you and me. And when we do good, we are doing it along with this force, where the force is empowering us to do it, helping us to do it. Now, on some days, Kaplan cares very much that you believe that too, because he thinks it's the only intellectually coherent and respectable belief about God that a modern person can hold. On other days, I read Kaplan as saying, you want to believe in what he calls a supernatural God? Gank is into head. Live and be well, right? as long as it keeps you a Jew. And his concern in the book, why does, why does he do this? Because he knows this is 1930s, he's got hundreds and thousands of good Jews, many of them rabbis, many of them teachers, social workers, community officials, who don't believe anymore in the traditional conception of God. And he doesn't want them to leave Judaism as a result. He wants to save them for Judaism. So he's being descriptive of himself, but I think there's a strong prescriptive element in Kaplan as well. Heschel, everything he writes after 1945, in my view, is done in the shadow and the trauma of the Holocaust. He gets out literally by the skin of his teeth. He escapes Poland weeks before Hitler marches in. His entire family, except for one sister, I think, and some cousins, is murdered by the Nazis. So he's got to have in him the sense, as he says, he was an ember plucked from the fire. He was saved for something. He's got to make something. And this something is to, this, what's burning in him is this faith in God despite the Holocaust. He's got to explain to himself and to all of us why he has that faith and how that faith has to manifest itself in life. And again, particularly because of the experience of the Nazis, I think, He's convinced that racism is a terrible evil. And we can't just sit around and study and do, do mitzvahs in the private sphere. We've got to make sure that America doesn't go down the same road that Germany went down. So I think Heschel is, is sharing something profound about himself, which, which you mentioned is descriptive. He's translating it for a contemporary American audience. He knows that we're not going to live in a Hasidic world. He himself chooses not to live with his cousins in Williamsburg and be a chassid anymore. He's chosen the modern world. And he wants us to become fervent Jews. I don't think he cares that we believe exactly what he believes or do exactly what he does, but he cares a lot 
that we be committed Jews. I tend to find with, with Heschel for, for myself and also for um, with, with a lot of Hasidic masters that, you know, sometimes it resonates so deeply the way they put things and sometimes it feels so out of reach, like, wow, they're having this experience that I really don't. If, on, if only I could feel that inspired. Um, whereas other times the articulation of religious inspiration is, is exactly what I need to sort of take, you know, take my experience to the next level. I don't know if, if you think that's a common um, with Heschel. It, you know, it's, it's very common. And, you know, you asked me about the Jew within. One of the things that struck me about the Jew within is that American Jews, by and large, still believe in God in some way. They may be Catholic's way and not Heschel's way, but they wrestle with this. And a lot of them pray at certain points. There may be boundary moments of life when they're praying and not every day, but they're praying. And they may not believe that there's a personal God hearing their prayer when they're praying. I mean, you and I go to synagogue all the time. And one of the most emotional moments in synagogue is the prayer for healing. And do the Jews who stand and say the prayer for healing all believe that God literally heals? I don't know. I don't think so. But they pray. They're, they're expressing, they're throwing a hope out there in God's direction. So one of the reasons I wrote the book, my book of theology, I should say, one of the reasons I'm writing this book, I haven't finished it yet, is because I want to show that you don't have to be Heschel or Kaplan, neither of which I am, to take God seriously and wrestle with these problems. I, I, I'm intimidated, and I try to tell myself, don't be intimidated, you can't be Heschel. You, you weren't born the son, grandson, and great-grandson of Hasidic rabbis going all the way back to the Baal Shem Tov. This is not, not in your genes, it's not in your DNA, right? And even Kaplan was the opposite. Kaplan, you know, was a Litvak among Litvaks. Kaplan was raised by this great rationalist tradition, also Orthodox. And I didn't come from a, a, a succession of rabbis either. So, you know, I, I think we can do, we can, this can help us if we don't get intimidated by it. Well, let's squeeze in one more question because it's so related yeah. to what you were just saying. So um, one person asked, how, how can we make it possible for contemporary Jews to speak about or share our experiences of God without fear of being considered um, wacko or, or being disdained? Why is it that personal uh, no. What the, and the person goes on, why is it that personal experiences of God are considered a Christian rather than Jewish idea? Yeah, and you know, and Heschel got this charge all the time when he talked about God having pathos and God caring and God feeling. So, oh, that's too Christian, Heschel, that's not Jewish. Look, there's a Litvak element in all of us, and we we're like too rational, and it's more and more common, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, for Jews to do precisely what the questioner asked and to share experiences of God, or if, if you chose not to call it God, call it an experience of transcendence or a signal of transcendence or, or a glimmer of something beyond us. You know, and it need not take place in synagogue. You know, it could be, it can happen, uh, oh, it's happened for me listening to a cello concerto and there's like one note and that note hits you and you say, oh my God, there's something more to this world than reason can understand or a moment of love for your spouse or your children or or a work of art etc or or a visit to nature and and you have a a conviction not just a hint you have a conviction reason is not going to explain this to me but i'm not going to let go of it and that's i think a crucial step that's why i wanted to teach that heschel thing about science and religion right about reason and and faith uh, you got to go beyond where your reason will let you. Heschel has this gorgeous line in Man Is Not Alone, where he says, after a while, the question is not whether God exists. The question is how to tell it to our minds. I love that. The question is how to tell it to our minds and still be self-respecting with our minds. You don't want to let go of your intellectual integrity. We care about that. But how do you tell it to your mind? And I think sitting around a table with a group of people you trust that's the place to do that conversation. That's what Neil Gilman's classes became. And I, I hope that more of our classes will become that. Beautiful. We have more questions. Hmm? Yeah, let's go on with your sources. So part two. In part two, I want to enumerate um, five um, carryovers from this that have, that have influenced Judaism in my generation. So now we're in present tense of my generation. I'm now 70. I, was born in 1951 and right, um, became, was a teenager in the 60s, went to college and graduate school in the 70s. 
And here are five things that are going on. All of them, I think, are a species of what the great theologian Franz Rosenzweig talked about in around 1920, when he wrote a famous letter to, to, to Buber called The Builders. And he said in that letter that we have to find a way from path to pathlessness. The path, in a word, is where Judaism has been until now, how it's been taught, how it's been lived. And pathlessness is where it has to go to stay alive. And there's no recipe for that, he maintained. You can't say, well, we had Shulchan Aruch before, and as long as we have Shulchan Aruch afterwards, we got Judaism. Or you can't say with some classical reform thinkers, well, we had ethical monotheism then, and we're going to have ethical monotheism in the future, and therefore we have Judaism. Heschel said, you have to somehow find the certainty that the leap has to be a leap from that which we know to that we need, which we need to know at any price is a leap to the teachings, to Jewish teachings. So we're going to have to make a leap from that which we know to that which we need to know at any price. So my doctoral dissertation in my first book was on the subject of how Jews are going to interpret the idea that Jews are God's chosen people. Why did I choose this subject? First of all, because it obsessed me personally. I was attracted to it and bothered by it, as many Jews are attracted to it and bothered by it today. And I did a, a content search, as it were. I looked through all the sermons and essays and books written by Jews, theologians, rabbis, community leaders, lay people that I could find between the 1930s and the 1970s. And I found that lo and behold, the subject of chosenness was far and away what they wrote about more than any other subject. And you can imagine why. Because here are the Nazis and some people of respectability are saying, Jews, you're responsible for genocide because you are the ones who introduced the notion of, a super of racial superiority to the world with this idea of chosenness. And you find Jews desperate to be accepted in America and they know they can't be accepted or it's not easy to be accepted if you claim that you're more chosen than everybody else. So it was a problem, it was a public relations problem, it was a moral problem, it was a political problem. And Mordechai Kaplan had argued that we have to get rid of it. So if you grew up in a reconstructionist synagogue or have visited one, you know that when you're called to the Torah, you don't say, Asher Bacharbanu Mikol Amim, who chose us from among the nations. You say, Asher Kervanu Lavodato, who brought us near to divine service because Kaplan hated the idea of the chosen people. So I wrote, my dissertation in my book about this idea. But more generally, this is an example of what Jews have always done. We have holidays, we have a prayer book, we've got texts like the Torah and the Bible, and they, they mean something, but we have to adapt their meaning to current circumstances. That's the first strategy of Jewish theology. Chosenness was displaced as the major topic of Jewish thought by far, sometime in the 70s and through the 80s by the Holocaust. It took a certain period of time before the reckoning began. As you know, survivors by and large did not wanna talk about the Holocaust to their children. And that took time. And until Elie Wiesel wrote his works and they became popular and Jewish theologians followed up it didn't get a lot of attention theologically. And there are a limited number of options. You can say, simplistically, that God sent the Holocaust as punishment, which is what the Satmar Rebbe is notorious for having said. You can say with the theologian Richard Rubenstein, who actually got his rabbinical ordination at JTS, that after Auschwitz, you can't believe in a God of history. He recommended gods of the earth, a kind of Jewish paganism. You can say that we don't know, which is what most Jewish theologians said, that God was hiding, God's countenance was hidden, Buber called it an eclipse of God. I just wanted to share with you a very famous passage by Emil Fackenheim from his little book, God's Presence in History. And Tani, can we see the page? In which Fackenheim talks about the commanding voice of Auschwitz. And he calls this the 614th commandment, and the first line of it is what is famous. Jews are forbidden to hand Hitler posthumous 
victories. They are commanded to survive as Jews, lest the Jewish people perish. They are commanded to remember the victims of Auschwitz, lest their memory perish. They are forbidden to despair of man and his world and to escape into inner cynicism or other worldliness, lest they cooperate in delivering the world over to the forces of Auschwitz. Finally, they are forbidden to despair of the God of Israel, lest Judaism perish. A secularist Jew cannot make himself believe by a mere act of will, nor can he be commanded to do so. And a religious Jew who has stayed with his God may be forced into new, possibly revolutionary relationships with him. One possibility, however, is wholly unthinkable. A Jew may not respond to Hitler's attempt to destroy Judaism by himself cooperating in its destruction. In ancient times, the unthinkable Jewish sin was idolatry. Today it is to respond to Hitler by doing his work. This is a really powerful paragraph. I don't have to tell you that. And I think it's emotionally resonant. I think emotionally, a huge number of Jews believe it, agree with it. I don't think that theologically or philosophically, you can defend the notion that Auschwitz itself commands anything. That's another issue. But you can see here why the question obsesses Jews and not only Jews, particularly given our world where genocide seems to keep happening, where evil seems to keep happening. And so you can't not ask the question, the old question about how a good God, a God who cares about the world and is active in history, can allow this to happen. Uh, there is no, as far as I'm concerned, convincing answer to that question. I spend a lot of time on it in my book because you can't not. Um, I put it in the Passover chapter because I think that the holiday of Passover raises the question, but I wanted you to be exposed to the question here. I'm going to stipulate that there's no great answer to it in modern Jewish thought because there can't be, but um, here it is. It's out there. Number three, um, next page. Starting in the same, around the same time, Another, next, next page, Tani, another major force presents itself in Jewish life and Jewish thought, and that force is Jewish feminism. Uh, Judith Plaskow publishes an essay in Tikkun and then a book called Standing Again at Sinai. In my opinion, this feminist quest for a Judaism that enables them to be true to it without sacrificing their feminism. And a feminism they can hold to without sacrificing their Judaism is a beautiful example of what Rosenzweig was talking about, about a need, a need, not a desire, but a need to reconceive Judaism, a need to take the leap. You need to know this at any price because you don't want to give up your feminism and you don't want to give up your Judaism. So here's an essay by a feminist philosopher, theologian, scholar named Rita Gross. Um, this is from Judith Plaskow's book, um, Women's Spirit Rising. And she's talking about God language. And this is the way the issue confronts us. So you can be um, a person who goes to shul, man or woman, and there can be a rabbi on the bima or, or a rabbi and a candor on the bima, both of them are women. And yet chances are very good if this is a conservative synagogue or even a reform synagogue, that all of the pronouns used in the liturgy to talk about God are gonna be male, are gonna be male. And you're gonna to be told and you believe that God has no body, therefore God has no gender, but therefore you find yourself asking, well, how is it then that we're gonna say he and him all the time and not she and her? And this question, of course, is pronounced again today. We talk about getting beyond um, binaries where, where gender is concerned. Well, here's Rita Gross way back, I think in the 70s, arguing, you see the therefore, it's time to move beyond God the Father. However, I propose to move beyond God the Father, which was the name of a book by the theologian Mary Daly, Beyond God the Father not to the verb of verbs, to say that God is not a noun but a verb, to a non-personal God concept, like Kaplan's, 
God as force, or God as fount of being, or God as ground of existence, which Mary Daly opts for. But an imagery, here she goes, of bisexual and androgynous deity, reintroducing the image of God as female to complement the image of God as male. In other words, shall we alternate between Baruch Atah and Baruch Ha'at? You get by it in English in second person, but you can't get by the problem in Hebrew. You're either going to say Atah or At, and you're going to have verbs that correspond. So Baruch Ha'at, Malkat Ha'olam, blessed are you God, queen of the universe. I wish to argue for this option because I am convinced that Judaism is theistic through and through. In other words, she wants a personal God. And that theism, the view that the absolute can be imaged as a person entering into relationships of love and responsibility with humans requires anthropomorphism, that is imaging God as human. But I'm equally convinced the images of God as a male person without complementing images of God as a female person are both a mirror and legitimation of the oppression and eclipsing of women. So here's the point of view that feminist theology made really prominent, aside from this particular case about male and female images, it is that theology has effects beyond religion. How you think about God impacts how you think the world should be. And if God is male, well, therefore it's natural that males should run things. And if God is female, females should run things. And if God is both male and female, well, what then for the world? And how do we accomplish this? So I don't want to, uh, again, I can't solve the question here. There's a huge amount of literature on it. And it's wonderful stuff. A lot of it is really good. And if you haven't studied it, um, I, I highly recommend it. There's a great literature. But to me, it's important in its own right. And it's important as an instantiation of getting Judaism to take a step into the unknown because you need it to go there. Judaism moves through people who need it to move there. Fourth question. Next page. Tony. I've shared with you here, next page, keep going, The Art Green, an essay by Arthur Green that I think is brilliant, came out in The Reconstructionist in 1988. It's important that it came out in The Reconstructionist because Green at that time was the head of the Reconstructionist of Rico College, as well as a disciple of Heschel, which he always is and has remained. Studied at JTS and Heschel was his master. And he writes this essay in 1988 called Rethinking Theology, in which he makes the case, um, you see it there, that the question we all have to face is how to, to speak about religion. And he says, he proposes something different. See where you are, um, Tiny, can you go down the page a little bit or? There you go, a little further, Hasidic sources of the early days, before Hasidism took on the role of defending tradition, bespeak a notion of dot or awareness as a central edifying value of religious life. This is Green's key move and it's twofold. Number one, most modern Jewish thought like Mendelssohn has proceeded rationally. Their major sources are the Bible and the rabbis and philosophical texts like Maimonides and Yehuda Levi. For Arthur Green, the major sources are mystical, Kabbalah and Hasidism. He comes out with a book about 10 years ago called Radical Judaism. The radicalness, I think, is in the sources, which are mainly mystical, Kabbalistic and Hasidic. And number two, the second innovation here is notice that it's not a question of what is true. We need a religious language that stresses da'at or awareness as a central edifying value of religious life. The early Hasidic master, as in other mystical master of the traditions, saw himself as a teacher of spiritual wakefulness and awareness, right? So here you have a notion that's really powerful today, still 
spirituality, wakefulness, awareness. In this, he differs from both the rabbi, teacher, and judge of proper daily living, lawgivers primarily, and the earliest Kabbalistic master who are the transmitters of esoteric law. So Kabbalah tells us a truth which you can only learn from master to disciple, all the sfirot and stuff about God that a normal person would never understand. For Green, it's a matter of awareness. The Hasidic teacher seeks to use the tradition and its language as a resource for the cultivation of the inner life. He sees this task as the very core of religion. Religion, Tani, thank you. Religion is the cultivation of an awareness that we live in relation to the transcendent, to something larger than ourselves. Notice what it is and what it isn't. It's the cultivation of an awareness that we live in relation to the transcendent, something larger than ourselves. The religious life is a life lived in constant striving for this awareness and in response to the demands made by it. Notice what has not been said. The word God does not appear here. It's not about belief in God, right? It's about a certain kind of life and a certain kind of awareness. From this point of view, all the institutions, practices, beliefs, and taboos of religion are centered around this awareness. Now, he goes on then to say that there is, in fact, and the vision of God here. I'm going to read you a few words from this, and then we're going to look at something else. He says, yud heh vav -Hey is, in short, all of being, all of being, but so unified and concentrated as to become being with a capital B, a deity beyond naming that fills the, all names as the soul fills the body. It is none other than the universe, yet it bespeaks a vision of the universe, so utterly transformed by integration and unity, as to appear as it is indeed other. I'll repeat that. It's none other than the universe. It bespeaks a vision of the universe, so utterly transformed by integration and unity. The universe is integrated and unified as to appear to us as indeed other, a mirror of the universe's self that becomes capital U, universal, capital S, self. Now, Green is what he himself calls a panentheist. A pantheist believes he cannot distinguish between God and the world. A panentheist believes that God is immanent in the world rather than transcendent above the world, but believes that somehow God is distinct from this world. The key line here, which I didn't give you, unfortunately, is that such a religious viewpoint is that of mystic and naturalist at once. That of mystic and naturalist at once. I translate this as saying, such a religion is that of Heschel and Kaplan at once. It demands no leap of faith, as does the miracle working deity of conventional theism. It requires rather a leap of consciousness. Now we get to a paragraph I, I really am fond of in this essay. But in the end, you wanna know, does this fellow believe in God? Do his careful formulations avoid the real issue? And if so, what is it that he's trying to avoid saying? And this is too complicated for us to do in one hour or three, but the answer is the figure of God, imaged by most religions, is a human projection. The person on the throne, to paraphrase one surprisingly radical Hasidic statement, is there because we put God there. But we who create God are also created by God we are creatures of a natural world that is itself a multicolored garbing of divine glory. The search for God, including the projection of our own uh, images onto the divine, is the most ennobling of human activities, and it is, in a sense, divine itself. So if we project images of God, it is we who are a part of God, God who is in us and all around us, that is projecting these images of God. Again, we're not gonna do it in detail, but I want you to see this as a tendency of Jewish thought that continues in our own period, namely that we should be putting the emphasis on spiritual awareness and spiritual practice. So if Michael Fishbane publishes a recent book called Sacred Attunement, 
and talks about attuning yourself to a reality greater than empirical science can confirm, he's in the same spirit. If we have an Institute for Jewish Spirituality, which teaches meditation, teaches Jews to cultivate a sense of presence, attentiveness, awareness, we're following the line that Green um, um, for, foreshadows here with this essay from 1988. Finally, there's one more predominant thrust of modern Jewish thought. And to get to it, I want to, I've given you a paragraph uh, that I dearly love. This is one of the most important paragraphs in modern Jewish thought it, because Heschel gave this religion and race address. This is the first paragraph of it at a conference in 1963 on religion and race where he met Martin Luther King. And the two become close friends and collaborators and Heschel marches at Selma, Alabama and Heschel helps talk King into denouncing the Vietnam War. And when King does so at Riverside Church, Heschel is on the platform right beside him. And here is Heschel saying that social justice is not just any old thing that Jews might wanna do, but the first conference on religion and race has Pharaoh and Moses and as the main participants. Moses says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who is this Lord that I should let my people go? Heschel says, the outcome of that summit meeting has not come to an end. Pharaoh was not ready to capitulate. The exodus began, but is far from having been completed. And it goes on and on to talk about how racism is anathema to religion and how the Jews must become involved in efforts at social justice. If you ask young Jews what they care about most in Judaism, you'll get the answer of spirituality sometimes. Other times you'll get the answer of social justice. And both of these tendencies, these emphases, go back to things that were emphasized by Jews in the previous generation. Okay, Tani, it's now 10 after three. I'll stop here and take a few more questions. Julia, you have a few questions, and then I'll go on and wrap it up. Okay, I've got a flood of questions. Um, <clears throat> there, there, um, a lot that kind of center around this this question of how we Im image or how we imagine God, I guess, and it connects mm -hmm. to gender. Um, and I, th I think um, I think something you read from Art Green kind of related to this, right? Like a lot of people, I think you were talking way at the beginning, where where do our ideas of of God and morality, et cetera, come from? I think for a lot of us, it's a childhood image that. We may or may not kind of wrestle with and try to modify over the course of our lives, but it, it rears its head often. Um, so, you know, which in which in most cases is a male image. Um, so, and one of the people joining us um, today is Naomi Gratz, who wrote about her. Um, you know, one of the articles that she wrote about. Um, which she said, we're coming up to, um, to a Haftarah from Hosea, where there's the image of God as wife beater, right? That this is this is the problem with an anthropomorphic God. It's, um, right, there, there's so many other things that we can, aside from gender, that we can layer onto an anthropomorphic God. Um, so there's there's sort of that those images that we that we struggle with, which maybe maybe kind of underlie our faith in a great way, and maybe also kind of cause us to struggle um, with with exactly what who is who is the God that we believe in. Um, and there was a question also about how do we how do we teach children in Jewish camps and schools about God in a way that they embrace faith and, and don't become atheists. For me, the answer, I put these together because for me, the, the answer is actually caught up in gender. I think we, we have to, um, we have to really update the way we, like the very language that we use and the images that we present because people do have images in their mind um, to get us to a different place. So I, I just threw a lot out there from a bunch of questions, but do you have a response to any of that? I have a, yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I have my eye on the clock and I realized that, uh, we're unfortunately getting to the end. We have to do this again, Julia. But um, every theology at a certain point runs into a brick wall. I say this without fear of contradiction. You're, you're going to get to a point where you have questions you can't answer. And no theology is without its own liabilities. So is God involved in history? 
Well, you want to give up on God's involvement in history. Okay. But once you have God in history, not only what do you do with the Holocaust, but what do you do with the state of Israel? Is God responsible for the creation of Israel? Is God responsible for the for the crimes that Israel sometimes commits? Is God responsible for history? Right? Is God responsible for Jim Crow? Is God responsible for civil rights? So these are difficult issues, and you can't you can, if you want to, try to escape them by get, kicking God out of history altogether. But that runs counter to a lot of Jewish tradition, and it runs counter to my own convictions, as it were. Um, so I, I don't want to do that. Same thing. I, I don't want to give up on a personal God, and yet I know that this is fraught with problems. I asked my theology class of rabbis-to-be, so when you say Kiddush, what's in your head? What are you thinking during those 60 seconds? And which is, I pose this question to everyone on the call. What, think about it this coming Shabbat when, when you say Kiddush. What's in your head? Are you thinking of the starry heavens? Are you thinking of a vine with grapes on it? Are you thinking of, and I, I bet this is true of many, of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel with that hand outstretched to touch the finger of Adam? What are you thinking? What's in your heads? And, and I think that you're absolutely right, Julia. It has to begin with childhood. And there has to be age-appropriate education. And it's often been said by people who know a lot more about this than I do, that teaching kids about God is a lot easier than teaching grown-ups because they have intuitions and experiences that leave them open to it until we come along with our rational armor and you know, prevent these experiences from getting through, as it were, until they become young scientists and go through the phase as 14-year-olds, well, of course I'm going to be an atheist, and then have to come out the other end, maybe sometime in your 20s when you fall in love, and you realize that love goes beyond the rational stuff too, and that maybe love's going to have something to do with God. So these are, these are questions that all of us have to ask and, and struggle with, and I think all these um, five ingredients that I've talked about thus far are part of the, uh, the deal. You want to finish up with what you plan to teach, and then we'll and then we'll save the rest of the questions till the end because I have so many. Take, take, take one, one, one more, more. And, then I'll, and then I'll come on. Okay. Um, all right. You know, here's a here's a nice curveball maybe for you. Um, someone was commenting on on um, the excerpt from Art Green that you shared and wrote that they those uh, writings don't seem especially Jewish. What makes them Jewish other than who is writing them, or is that sufficient? Well, you know, first of all, the, uh, a fundamental rule of any classroom that I'm in, including this one, is there's no question that's out of, out of line, right? Every question is a good question. And this one happens to be a particularly good question because I asked Art Green this question. And at the end of the essay, he comes up and he says, right, um, we turn to Judaism not because it is the superior religion, and certainly not because it is God's single will, but because it is our own. In this matter, Rabbi Kaplan remains our teacher. Judaism is our teacher. Judaism is our spiritual home. Well, that's that's not enough to satisfy, and it's not enough to satisfy Green because in subsequent books he said more. But this is the eternal question facing Jewish thought, particularly in the modern period. We are both universal and particular. You saw that in that very first selection for Mendelssohn. We're not just about Jews. Judaism is not just about Jews. Bereshit is not about Jews. We're about human beings. And yet we maintain that there's something particularly important about Jews and demands co commitment and loyalty to the Jewish community and to the Jewish people. So every Jewish theology worthy of its name has to talk about both the universal and the particular. And I found myself drawn to that as well and struggling with it. You know, one person um, answered your question about Kiddush, which I think I think dovetails ni nicely with what you just said. Uh, the person wrote, um, you know, what, what's she thinking about during 60 seconds of Kiddush? I'm thinking about all those who have said Kiddush before me. Um, that that's, that's her primary connection to prayer. Um, and that's, she said, she wrote, that's how I can say words that don't necessarily resonate with me personally. I'm honoring those who said them before. 
there's I sort of an angle that. to the particularism. That's right. And I, I think that here's where Mendelssohn's second element comes into play, which I call tradition. Tradition is a source of great authority to Jews and especially to modern Jews, because they may not have a competing source of authority, but the fact that our ancestors did this, that's good enough for us, right? It's good enough for us. We find meaning in the fact that our ancestors did this. I have a chapter on this in my book, Rethinking Modern Judaism. Pesach means something to, to us because we know our ancestors in some way, shape, or form observed Pesach. They, they also had a Seder. And in fact, grandparents may have been at our Seders when we were children, and they're no longer there, and our parents may no longer be there, and that makes it all the more meaningful that we're going to do it and honor them and bring them with us, as it were, as we bring Judaism into the future. I think this is a profoundly important thing for Jews. I guess the, the source oh, of authority and the community is a source of authority. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I think, um, you know, it's powerful for us. And I guess part of the challenge is how long does that stay powerful? How long does that stay kind of a, um, for how many generations can that stay a key motivating reason? But that's, that's another question. We'll see. And one of the more famous lines in the works of Solomon Schechter is when he said in 1895 that for him, tradition is very important, but history alone is not going to do it. It's not going to guarantee the future of the Jews. So you can't just have historical Judaism, as it were. You have to have mitzvot and, and God in some way. All right, let me, let me wrap up. And maybe if I, if I can do this quickly, there'll even be time for a question or two afterwards, Julia. So I found myself writing a book and once I decided to write it and thought about it, I realized it had to have four attributes, which I'm now gonna name. I'm not gonna read you my preface, which I would have done if there were more time. I hope someday we all get to read my preface in print. Number one, Jewish theology is personal. It arises out of personal experience as you and the questioner just said. It can't not be personal, even Maimonides, my God, the most systematic thinker you can imagine. Well, we know because he tells us. His thinking arises out of personal experience. He was traumatized by the death of his brother at sea. Maimonides is personal. Everything's personal. Heschel was personal. Huber was personal. Kaplan was personal. We're all personal, and that's right. And so I don't want to write a memoir, but I've included some personal stories in my theology because I think they're... This is the truth of my theology. It comes out of personal experience. And so you got to know the person who's doing it. Let me just say briefly what I've said before, that by far the high point of religious experience in my life was watching my first child be born. To be there in the living room and watch my child be born, nothing before or since has compared to that. That's, that's a religious experience par, par excellence. Second, theology responds to history. You think about the Tanakh, the Torah, the Tanakh, the rabbis, we're responding to history. You can't not respond to history. And all of us, whether we're conscious about it or not, are living, as it were, in the shadow of the Holocaust and the sunshine of the recreation of the state of Israel. These are two momentous events Nothing like them, it happened in 2000 years. And here we are, those of us who live now, who are influenced by them. And in more prosaic ways and in more immediate ways. So when I'm writing a book, starting in July, 2020, I'm writing about COVID. I cannot. COVID is all over my book. I mean, a million people have not been killed by this disease in the United States alone. So you can't not respond to this. Or I happened to be writing about in the week before Parashat HaKoyimot Kedushim, Kedushim last year. And the Derek Chauvin verdict in the George Floyd trial came out that week. So I'm looking at the juxtaposition of Black Lives Matter on the one hand and you shall love your neighbor as yourself on the other. And I can't not put the two together because they are together in my consciousness. So theology responds to history. And so history is all over my book. Third thing, theology should be accessible to everybody. You, you know that this is my Neil Gilman inheritance. I believe this. It cannot be true. It cannot be true that you have to know physics 
and mathematics at a high level before you can do metaphysics and therefore theology. Rambam has to be wrong about this. The Torah commands us to love the Lord our God. I don't think that means we have to know the Lord our God. That's beyond the capacity of mortal human beings. But to not be able to think at all about God and yet be commanded to love God? No way. So I think that you and I can do lots of things. We have lots of capabilities. We've got lots of assistance from science and art and experience and all sorts of different cultures, not just Judaism. But we can say something reasonable about what God wants of us, even if we can't presume to know God as God actually is. And finally, I think that every Jewish theology has multiple voices. If you think of how the Torah is constructed, not just with Leviticus, as it were, but with Deuteronomy, or how the Tanakh is constructed, not just with Job and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, right? but those stories about kings and and prophets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Tanakh is an amazing number of voices. Think about the Psalms. Think about the prayer book. Then you get the Zohar, it's all of our commentary tradition. Judaism is multiple voices. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to include multiple voices in it. So I did something actually radical that I've never seen anybody else do, but it was the way I decided to go. I started with letters to my friends, letters to my closest friends where I could be the most natural and the most honest. And then I wrote letters from my friends back to me in their voices, which I know well because they're my good friends. So I put their voices into my book. It's true, it's been written by me, but authentically true to their voices. And I wanna make the point that we all get by in life and in theology with the help of our friends. There's no other way to do it. And I think I now have five minutes, Julia, so we can take a couple final questions. Did you, did you mean to quote the Beatles at the end there? I did mean to quote the Beatles, and I'll tell you that the keystone of my faith as well is in um, Parashat Nitzavim of Dvarim, where it says that the hidden things, the, the, the um, niglot, belong, the nistarot, sorry, the nistarot belong to God. But the revealed things belong to us and our descendants to do the mitzvot that God commands, which I take to mean, as the Rolling Stones said, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find that you get what you need. So the 60s and popular music are very important to my theology. That's my favorite um, parenting line also, the one you just quoted. <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, Arnie, a lot of people are saying how they can't wait for your book to come out, which I feel the same way. But let's, so let's, um, I, I feel like we did some of the grand sweeping things, but let me let me squeeze in a few um, sure. more specific questions. Um, first of all, someone shared just a, a wonderful anecdote about hearing Kaplan speak at the age of 91, um, where he was just railing against Heschel's contention that, um, yeah. that our prayers um, can actually impact someone's healing and, and that he was banging on the podium. And um, this, the, the person who shared the anecdote was writing how on the one hand, she needed spiritual sustenance. Her father had just died. And then on the other hand, she was so attracted to his, uh, to his, his view, kind of this, the rationalist acting out his anger, she wrote, it was just this powerful image that's really stuck with her. So I just thought I'd share that. Um, Someone asked if um, if you would differentiate and how um, Kaplan's understanding of God uh, from Spinoza. It's it's too complicated, but I can tell you that I asked Kaplan if he had been influenced by Spinoza when I met him at the age of ninety five, and he said no. But we know he was because his diaries testified to the influence of Spinoza. But it's much too complicated. Uh, Kaplan seems to believe more more in this, as it were, will intention. Uh, almost consciousness inside the force that is directing human life toward universal goodness. So I, I don't think that Spinoza has that amount of confidence that the world is actually going somewhere good. Um, someone asked way at the beginning about Mendelssohn, if you had any comment about the fact that his children and certainly his grandchildren 
um, didn't find his his thought and his choices compelling and they didn't choose Judaism. Yeah, I do. Because if you say to your kids, Judaism is not the only path. You can be a good person as a Christian. You can have God as a Christian. You, you certainly get to any afterlife that's there as a Christian. You don't need to be Jewish for this. This is a simple system, but there are other systems of symbols. We have holidays, they have holidays. And there's economic discrimination against Jews. And it's much more attractive to fit into a majority culture. So why be Jewish? And I think if you're going to raise kids in a Christian city, as he did, where Jews were not allowed to live except by special permission, and they can't have Jewish friends because there are not many Jews there, there's a lesson for us in that. You want your kids to be Jewish, send them to a place where there are going to be lots of Jewish kids, right? Don't, don't be the only Jew in town. So it's, it's a very, it's, Mendelssohn is a great modern Jewish thinker because he has our problems and no solution to them. Right. Someone, someone sent in right at the end, will our grandchildren live in the shadow of the Holocaust and the sunshine of Israel? So that, that question could mean a lot of things. I'm, I'm reading that as um, kind of a response to, to what, you, what you laid out as your four kind of the premises of, of theology, that it's that it's personal, that it's historical, um, that it has to be something that we ourselves grasp, um, and that it involves the voices of people around us. I, I, that's how I'm I'm reacting to that that question. That there's what you're what you're sharing with us is that theology has to be rooted in, in the real of who we are, who, who what the world is, but the world as we experience it. So one of the um marks of things to come which i would have shared if there were time is a piece by my student professor mara benjamin who has written a great book called the obligated self and i couldn't share this piece with you because it's not published yet but it's about climate change it's about how theology has to respond to climate change and now we predict that jews like everybody else of subsequent generations are going to be living in the shadow of the global catastrophe caused by climate change and the sunshine is going to be any way we find of coping with it and finding meaning in it and using Jewish tradition to get us through it. That's, that's going to be the history that Jewish tradition in the next generation responds to, I believe. Thank you so much. This was a, such an amazing way to end this series. You, you, um, you talked about theology needing to be accessible, and you really you brought so many ideas together for us and created an incredibly accessible framework. I think um, everyone who attended the previous sessions, I know I was I was hearing echoes from um, a lot of your colleagues on the faculty um, in your framing that that were incredibly helpful. So thank you so much. You know, you were on uh, first. You were the chancellor. You know, leading JTS when the pandemic started, and then you were on sabbatical. Um, when we were when this series really got going, but now now you're uh, back on the faculty, and it's so wonderful to have you teach for us Pleasure. part of these Monday series. So I hope that you will come back um, again. It's just th thank you so much for teaching us today. Pleasure. And um, thank you once again to Yale Aspel for sponsoring this wonderful session. And thanks to everyone who joined us for the series and for the session today. And as I said at the beginning, um, watch your email and register for our new series on stories and storytelling this coming summer. Um, and in the meantime, have a wonderful um, Memorial Day and, uh, and Shavuot more saliently, um, accepting the Torah, however, however you understand that. And we'll see you again on the other side. Thanks again to everyone and to Professor Eisen.